In the attractive English county of Sussex, visitors from all over the world are drawn to one historic location. Almost 1,000 years ago, this was the setting for one of the most significant military encounters of all time. On the 14th of October, 1066, two great medieval armies gave their all in battle. The English against the invading Normans. On a low ridge beside the road to London, an English army took up its positions on the instructions of their king. 7,000 infantrymen formed into a solid wall of shields. Against them stood the Normans of Duke William, a force similar in size, but including mounted cavalry amongst its number. At stake was a prize that both leaders believed was rightfully theirs, the throne of England itself. About nine o'clock in the morning, battle commences. 7,000 men on each side. Um, enormous, terrifying noise that was taking place on this site, on that. Saxons shouting out, out, out. Normans wanting to come claim the throne of England. In the hours that followed, the Battle of Hastings was bitterly fought out. It may still be the most important day in the whole of English history. The Battle of Hastings was a fundamental shift in, in English history. Uh, England in the 9th and uh, early 10th century was part of the Scandinavian world. Hastings put it into the continental and particularly the French world. The tumultuous events of October 1066 ultimately stemmed from a simple political question. Who had the right to be the King of England? The answer would be decided on this truly historic battlefield. It was a complex issue involving three great medieval powers, England, Normandy, and the Vikings of Scandinavia. When we enter the world of Dark Age politics, we enter a, a very murky world indeed. And what we have here is a, a complex situation which is triggered by the fact that the incumbent King of England known as Edward the Confessor, has no son and heir. He has no daughters either, so there's nobody to take the throne on his death, and obviously his death is approaching. There were three main claimants to the throne. The boy Edgar Atheling had a strong claim as the great-grandson of King Ethelred, but his youth counted against him. The blood claim of Harold Godwin was far more tenuous, but he had the crucial support of many leading English noblemen. He was desperate to rule his country, but across the Channel in Normandy, the ruling Duke William was convinced of his right to the English throne. Edward had informally promised the throne and the succession to a distant blood relative of his, a distant but still nonetheless a genuine relative who was William, Duke of Normandy. What actually happened in practice is that as soon as Edward dies, the throne is usurped by Harold Godwinson, who has a claim to the throne of England through the fact that his sister was married to Edward the Confessor. Now, he usurps the throne of England and takes it for himself, which clearly is like a red flag to a bull to someone as decisive and full of action as William, Duke of Normandy. The bio tapestry shows a furious King William receiving news of the coronation. It also shows his reaction. He calls a council of war and orders a huge fleet to be assembled to carry an army to England. His preparation in France was enormously effective. He'd got the political and religious support of Emperor Henry IV and the Pope. 
he had um, gathered together a very uh, effective force which comprised not only Normans, a large number of mercenaries and knights without land, who he promised land to. He'd built a navy, and so he'd prepared extremely well. We can clearly see this fleet on the tapestry, along with the weapons and other supplies to be used by his men. William was intending a full-scale invasion of England. Through the summer of 1066, an invasion army made ready on the Normandy coast. Significantly, it included men trained in a distinctively Norman branch of warfare. These were William's mounted troops, his cavalry. King Harold of England was soon to learn the effectiveness of Norman cavalry. But as 1066 unfolded, the Norman threat was not his only problem. His own brother, Tostig Godwin, had been exiled to Flanders the previous year. But in May 1066, Tostig arrived at the Isle of Wight with a fleet of ships. He proceeded to plunder the south coast of England as far as the port of Sandwich. In response, Harold mobilised an army, but his brother sailed north before battle could be joined, halting in Scotland, where he enjoyed the protection of the Scottish King Malcolm. King Harold's difficulties now increased. In addition to the Saxon claim and the Norman claim, there's also a Scandinavian claim to the throne of England, which goes back three or four generations. And as a result of that, King Hardrada of Norway decides that he too will come to England and compete for the throne. To finally confuse the situation, Hardrada is supported by Tostig, who is Harold of England's brother. So you have this incredibly complex and dangerous situation, which is clearly only going to be resolved by force of arms. By August 1066, Hardrada was in the Norwegian territory of the Orkney Islands, with over 10,000 warriors under his command. Harold now faced the daunting prospect of war on two fronts. Perhaps Harold now considered the meaning of the comet that had appeared in the sky earlier in the year as depicted on a memorable panel of the Bio Tapestry. We now know that this was the famous Halley's Comet. But in those superstitious days, many believed comets to be a sign of impending doom. As autumn approached, the situation was, potentially, disastrous for the English leader. His cause was not helped when he was forced to disband his own army. As the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle describes, his soldiers had fulfilled their allotted period of duty. Under the terms of obligation of the time, King Harold was forced to pay them off and allow them to go home. These were the soldiers that made up the bulk of English armies of the age. They were common subjects, men whose obligations to their king included the requirement to carry out military service. In medieval England, they were known as the men of the feared. The feared was what today we would call a militia. And a feardman was somebody whose full-time job was in the civilian economy. In uh, Anglo-Saxon England, he was probably a farmer. And the feardman spent his days raising crops and supporting the civilian economy. In time of war, he could be briefly spared. It does you no good to keep the feared men away from their farms. Otherwise, there's no point in defending your country because you'll all starve to death anyway. Harold's army was stood down on Friday, September the 8th, 1066. Shortly afterwards, the combined forces of Harold Hardrada 
and Tostig Godwin sailed into English waters in Northumbria, carrying out bloody coastal raids as they swept south towards the Humber estuary. Their objective was clear, to capture the great fortified city of York. In response, the loyal English earls Edwin and Morker now raised an army of resistance and on the 20th of September 1066 the invaders and the defenders met just two miles outside York. This was the Battle of Fulford Gate, a bloody infantry engagement from which the Norwegians emerged triumphant. Harold's reign was now in serious trouble. Without a standing army he already knew that William's arrival from Normandy was imminent. Now he learnt with horror of invasion from the north. But his reaction was courageous. He decided to march north to engage Hardrada in battle, even though he would have to muster his army as he went. In just four days, he travelled the 200 miles from London to Tadcaster in Yorkshire, arriving on Sunday the 24th of September. In the course of the journey, he gathered together a force of some 7,000 men. Harold's march north uh, to deal with the threat of Harold Hardrada was a very bold move. Uh, it took considerable organisation uh, and uh, to arrive uh, up in the north and discover that, that his local forces had already been defeated and still go into battle, uh, suggests a, a, a general who has the confidence of his troops. On Monday the 25th of September 1066, King Harold Hardrada and his ally Tostig must have felt pleased with themselves. That morning, at their base at Rickle near Stamford Bridge, the victorious commanders prepared to dictate peace terms to the defeated northern Englishmen. But now an astonishing sight began to emerge. A dust cloud coming from the direction of York. The awful truth quickly dawned upon the Norsemen. It was King Harold of England's army and it had caught them completely by surprise. Desperately, the invaders attempted to form themselves into a defensive shield wall but the ferocity of the English soldiers proved decisive. In the shield wall, the men would stand shoulder to shoulder with the interlocking shields, which would provide a defensive front that the, the opposition would then have to try and literally hack their way through. It was a very standard set of tactics which was practiced by the Viking armies and by the Anglo-Saxons. So that would be recognised by both Harold Godwinson and King Hardrada's forces when they arrived. So the type of battle that they fought uh, used essentially very similar tactics. Both sides had the shield wall, they stood shoulder to shoulder, they came in, they locked together and it became a close quarter slugging match with uh, cutting weapons and axes and swords. Behind the shield walls you would have um, archers who would try and find uh, gaps in the opposition's ranks, but the archers were very much a secondary force. The real fighting and the real emphasis were on the men in the front ranks. They were the best armoured, they had the best weapons and they had the best equipment. Little is known of the action at Stamford Bridge. But Harold's best troops would have made an undoubtedly terrifying sight in combat. These were the crack units of the English army, the housecarls. The housecarls were uh, the elite of English soldiers in the 11th century. Uh, they were personally bound to the king or to the great nobles. Uh, they were pretty expert fighting men. Typical housecarl armour consisted of a conical helmet and a chainmail shirt known as a hauberk, 
both of which were derived from Norman design. The influence of the Normans could also be seen in the lances and swords carried by many of the housecarls, and also in the kite-shaped shields carried by many. The traditional Saxon round shield would also have been in evidence, but it may be that shields of any type had little role to play at Stamford Bridge. The housecarl's love of offensive fighting meant that, in battle, they often chose to strap their shields behind their backs. This freed both their hands to wield one of the most terrifying weapons of the age. They had awesome, fearsome weapons, the double-handed axe, which was quite capable of chopping a man's head off, chopping a man in two even, and even taking the head off of a horse. Believe me, you would not want to face one of these men. They were really frightening men. As the Battle of Stamford Bridge unfolded, the axe-wielding housecarls fought alongside the ordinary foot soldiers, armed with their swords, clubs and shields. And it was this combined force of Englishmen that carried the day. At some point, the Norwegian king, Harald Hardrada, was killed. Not long afterwards, the rebellious brother of the English king was also dead, and the invading army was in rout. By early evening, King Harold of England had proved himself a leader in battle. Assessing Harold's uh, military leadership is quite difficult. The march up to uh, the north to deal with Harold Hardrada uh, speaks of a fairly decisive soldier. Uh, and the victory he won against Harold Hardrada was a pretty impressive victory. He clearly was an opportunist. For example, he gets to York on the 24th of September and immediately attacks Harold Hardrada at Stamford Bridge on the 25th, seeing that Hardrada's forces were divided. They were not all together, and there is some evidence, perhaps, that some of them didn't even have their armour with them. So in that sense, I think, tactically, he's, he's quite astute. When you get to Hastings, though, um, that's somewhere where I think his uh, shortcomings are shown up. Just a few days after King Harold's greatest achievement, he received the news that he was dreading. William of Normandy was on English soil, and his army was with him. If Harold's achievement in marching north to victory was remarkable, then William's success in putting together an invasion fleet was equally impressive. By mid-September, an armada of over 600 ships sat at anchor at saint valais sur somme waiting for the right wind to carry them across the channel. As many as 7,000 men waited for the order to sail, but for a fortnight the wind refused to change. It must have been difficult for William to maintain morale and discipline, especially as his troops were not just his fellow Normans. He was faced with the task of offering people a big bag of loot, land, money, Anything you could ask for, salvation. The Pope was offering salvation. All you've got to do is cross over to England and you will get loot and salvation. I think that anybody would wait an extra two weeks in return for loot and salvation. Especially when you consider they were following somebody who was a proven, successful military leader. William of Normandy has a number of major advantages over um, Harold um, of England. Harold had only been king for nine months. William had been in command for a number of years and also had quelled rebellions within his own country. He was known to be brave, he'd proved himself in battle and therefore he had um, a reputation, a military reputation, which is an important factor. On Wednesday, the 27th of September, 
The wind changed at last, and William's flagship, the Mora, raised anchor and set off at the head of a truly impressive force. The following day, the Normans arrived at Pevensey on the south coast of England, which was quickly taken, along with the nearby town of Hastings. After building fortifications at both locations, William pondered his next move. Soon, the English king had to do likewise. Around October the 1st, Less than a week after defeating the Vikings, he received the grim news from the south. Another great battle loomed, but many of the best English troops had been lost at Stamford Bridge. Harold faced another exhausting march if he was to engage William quickly, but that is exactly the course of action that he decided upon. Taking his surviving elite troops with him, he set off on the 200-mile journey to London, where he succeeded in putting together another army of 7,000 men. He then headed west towards William's position. In total, the whole process took just 13 days. He seems to have felt that he had to dispose of William quickly. William was encamped right in the heart of his earldom uh, and uh, there were difficulties there. He himself, his cl blood claim was not too good and therefore if he didn't dispose of enemies quickly he might seem to be weak and other claimants might come forward. So that there was a pressure on Harold, uh, he disposed of Harold Hardrada and got the advantage of surprise. He may have hoped to do that again. Harold might well have waited before uh, moving south of London to give battle. The logic of waiting uh, is that uh, his men were exhausted after a long march north and a long march south. Uh, many of uh, his forces have yet to be gathered. Certainly the full potential uh, might of the, the English mobilised army was, was, was not there. Uh, and that by waiting he could only get stronger whereas William, at the end of a long supply chain in a hostile country, uh, could uh, only get weaker. We will never know for sure if a less hasty deployment of English troops would have influenced the result of the Battle of Hastings. What is certain is that on the 13th of October, 1066, Duke William was informed of the imminent arrival of his enemy. The following morning, the English and the Normans faced each other. They were just a few miles away from the town that would give the forthcoming battle its name and its place in history. King Harold chose to position his men on a low ridge in open country near to the London Hastings Road. It was a defensive arrangement, forcing William to take the initiative. In the middle of his line were his elite troops, the House Carls and Thanes, many of them survivors of the Battle of Stamford Bridge. On the flanks, he positioned his regular troops, the men of the feared. These regular soldiers were far more lightly armoured than the housecarls. Typical battle dress consisted of a leather jerkin and trousers, with the legs also bound in leather. Principally, it was the axe that gave the man of the feared his greatest strength, but at Hastings, 
it was the defensive power of his shield that King Harold first sought to employ. Well, this area we're standing on now is known as the Lower Terrace. And it was in this area that, on that day in 1066, this is where the Saxon army was, was stood. They were placed in 10 to 12 rows deep um, across an area of about three quarters of a mile. And they were looking out across the battlefield over here at one of the strongest fighting for forces in the world. The level of this battlefield has risen by about 12 feet um, since those days in 1066. And um, it was an incredible task for the Normans to actually come up this hill. The only way that um, William could get at him was to uh, approach from an opposite hill, go down into a valley and up the hill at, to attack a fairly narrow front. Possibly as many as 7,000 men formed a line almost half a mile in length, with the shields of the leading troops joining together to form a shield wall. The shield wall permits you to defend. It's a very strong form of defense. You stand behind your shield. Uh, it doesn't allow you to attack aggressively but it permits you to stand there and defend yourself till the cows come home. Cavalry can charge a shield wall, but the horses will stop before they get to the shields because to the horses, it's like charging a wall. And horses are far too smart to charge a wall, so horses will stop before they get there. And even people, when they attack a shield wall, they have tremendous problems getting past those big shields. As long as those shield walls held, Harold wins. The English force was impressive, but it was not as substantial as it could have been. Archers were few in number, and the English fought entirely on foot. By contrast, the similarly sized Norman army included as many as 2,000 mounted knights armed with deadly spears. These were professional soldiers, many of them veterans of successful campaigns in regions such as Italy, Brittany and France. Significantly, it was against the French in the year 1053 that the Norman knights first adopted a cunning tactical maneuver. This involved lines of cavalry pretending to retreat. The idea was to draw out an enemy line and then turn on them. Against the French, this feigned flight had worked. On the morning of the 14th of October, 1066, perhaps William considered the tactic again. But as he ordered his men into battle positions, he organized them into three divisions. At the rear was the cavalry, each knight protected by a hauberk and helmet similar to those worn by the English troops. Typically, the Norman knight was armed with the spear and his most precious weapon of all, his steel sword, intended to be used as a slashing implement, as the bio-tapestry makes clear. In front of William's cavalry came his infantry. Like the men of the English feared, these foot soldiers were often lightly armoured, although some men were able to enter battle with the protection of chainmail. At the very front of his army, he positioned his complement of archers. These were the most lightly armoured of all the Norman troops, and with good reason. They were intended to be highly mobile soldiers, armed with a short bow, a weapon whose arrows proved highly effective at a range of up to 300 yards. The army of William 
was split really into three sections. Where we're standing now stood the Breton troops. On the far side of the battle stood the Frankish and Flemish troops. And these were mercenary soldiers. These were soldiers that had been brought over on promise of land in England if they were to conquer England. In the centre stood the Norman troops. The difference between the Saxons and the Normans, of course, is that the Normans had a, a better array of tactical options open to them. And what we'll see in the Battle of Hastings as it develops is that William is able to use the three different elements of his army to vary the tactics, whereas essentially the Saxons lined up on the hill only have one tactic which is to stand shoulder to shoulder with your shields locked together and come to grips with the enemy if he advances upon you. William's intention was to use his archers to soften up the English line with short bow fire. Protected by this fire, his infantry would then advance, followed finally by the cavalry. At nine o'clock in the morning, the Norman trumpet sounded. The Battle of Hastings had begun. The first action of the battle was when the Norman archers moved to within about 150 yards of the Saxon troops. They fired their arrows into the Saxon line. To little effect, the arrows just embedded into the Saxon shields. The archers' attack was not decisive. The English shield wall held. William now pressed forward with an infantry advance up the ridge and into the English line. The hand-to-hand -hand fighting was ferocious. But again, the Normans failed to break through. Within minutes, William's foot soldiers were returning to their own lines. The cavalry now charged but the Norman knights also failed to break the tenacious English defence. Many mounted men perished, and still the English shield wall held. But now came a moment of drama that would profoundly influence the course of the day's events. As the fighting continued, on the left flank of William's line, a rumour began to spread through the Breton troops. The apparent news was the worst possible. Their leader, Duke William, was dead. Fearing that the battle was now lost, they turned and fled. The Bretons, running up this steep slope behind me, found themselves in trouble and they began to retreat. The Saxons thought, good! We're on to a good thing. We're winning. And they raced after them down into the valley. It was a fatal move. Terrible casualties were inflicted upon the retreating Normans. But now the truth about King William became clear. He was not dead after all. It had been just a rumour. Seeing what was happening, the Norman leader bellowed his presence to his men. He went out to the front, to put, pulled his helmet up to show who, who he was, encouraged his troops to go forward, and organised horsemen to support the Bretons on the left. The fighting spirit of his men was immediately restored, and it was the English who now found themselves in a desperate situation. Those troops who had advanced against Harold's orders were now trapped in open ground, and William now proved the power of his cavalry. The Norman knights in the centre wheeled round, the Saxons were trapped, they were chopped to pieces, and the Saxon line at the top of this ridge began to become more and more stretched. It was a very important part of the battle. We are now standing on the position of that Breton army in 1066. King Harold had lost his right flank, but the battle was by no means over.
Around midday, the fighting lulled as both commanders considered the position. William knew that it would be extremely difficult to win a battle lasting more than one day. He would have to go all out for victory that afternoon. Again the battle was joined as all sections of the Norman army attacked the English position. Bowman, foot soldier and mounted knight combined their efforts. Soon holes began to appear in the English line. King Harold's two younger brothers were killed, but still William was aware of the slowness of his offensive. So he decided to adopt a new tactic to finish the English off for good. The failed English attack designed to take advantage of this, this uh, bit of retreat on the part of the Normans gave William an, an idea. And the idea was if they'll break ranks and attack when they think we're retreating a little bit, what if we retreat a lot? Perhaps remembering how the feigned retreat tactic had worked for the Normans 13 years before, he gave the order for the cavalry withdrawal. His judgment was correct. On not one, but two occasions, the Norman cavalry made fake retreats. Sure enough, on each occasion, the English troops followed down the hill, only for the cavalry to wheel round and surround them. The cavalry began to pretend to run away. The Saxons, not learning their lesson from earlier in the day, started running after them again, thinking, hey, we're winning. And they started running after them down into the valley again. Same thing happened. Normans wheeled round. They were trapped in the valley. They were chopped to pieces. <laughs> It was important because it meant that the English vacated the hill which the Normans had been attacking during that day and by doing that exposed themselves and enabled the Normans effectively to break the line. I, I do think we need to be aware that this feigned withdrawal blends into something else that the Normans were doing which was perhaps a little bit subtler that they were using their combination of different arms to gradually break down the coherence of the Saxon shield wall infantry, archers, cavalry charges, and, and those different arms all require a slightly different formation to deal with best. Uh, and, and by using those arms in a judicious mixture, you gradually break down the cohesion of the English shield wall. By the middle of the afternoon, William knew that the tide of the battle was with him. But still the English resistance continued. Now, the Norman commander ordered his archers to change their targets and concentrate their fire on the lightly armoured soldiers of the English rear with devastating effect. Many men were lost in the attack. William said that rather than fire the arrows straight at the Saxon line, fire them into the air. Fire them into the air and let them rain down on the Saxon troops. It was a brilliant move. You can imagine the terror of this rain of arrows coming out of the sky at you. The use of archers uh, was uh, decisive in helping break up uh, the solidity of the English shield wall. Once that uh, wall begins to break into segments, uh, then cavalry can pour through the gaps, uh, get round the back, uh, and uh, uh, it becomes uh, a situation where the height that the horseman has uh, is a very significant advantage. Soon, the English troops received news of an even more devastating blow. It was during this period of the attack, we're coming now towards the evening time, that Harold was actually struck by an arrow from the sky. He was wounded badly in the eye. 
fell to the ground, the Norman knights now with this line at the top being forever stretched, broke through. On the bio tapestry, this historic moment is depicted clearly. Underneath the words, hic, Harold, Rex, interfectus est. King Harold has been killed. Now we come to the spot where Harold actually fell. Now, if you can imagine that day, 1066, Harold severely wounded in the eye, falls to the ground, surrounded by his loyal house Carls, who will give their lives to him, fight to the very, very last. The Norman knights now have split their way through this stretched line of Saxons, and they make their way for Harold. Eventually, the house Carls are destroyed, Harold is chopped to pieces by Norman knights. Harold's death sealed the Battle of Hastings. Duke William of Normandy had won. Actually saying why a battle's won and lost simply is very difficult. A very crude answer might be that whereas Harold was killed, William, according to uh, William of Poitiers' accounts, had three horses killed under him. If, instead of a horse being killed under him, he was killed, the entire battle would have gone the other way. To rally the troops, the hold of the line, and also to take decisive action against the English incursion on his left, carried the day. It was a, quite a question. The battle was won by the better, better leader on the day, and I think William was. As dusk fell on the 14th of October, 1066, the battlefield of Hastings was a scene of carnage, and the English nation had suffered a terrible defeat. We will never know how many thousand men died that day. During the days that followed, according to one popular English account, the body of King Harold was taken to Waltham Abbey for burial, as William set off to secure his rule in England. Two weeks before the Battle of Hastings, Harold Hardrati had a, a claim to the English throne, and he was killed at Sanford Bridge. Harold Godwinson's brother Tostig had a claim to the English throne, and he was also killed at Stamford Bridge. On the morning of the Battle of Hastings, Harold had brothers, and by the end of the day, they were dead. Uh, on the morning of the Battle of Hastings, Harold was a live English king, and at the end of the day, he was dead. Who was left? The King of Denmark, but he was not there on the ground with an army. Edgar Atheling, he was a boy. William, at the end of the Battle of Hastings, was the only man in England with a claim to the throne and an army to back it up. No one else had the stomach within England uh, to fight and eventually uh, the remaining English uh, nobles uh, and bishops and archbishops and so forth uh, do a deal uh, with William. On Christmas Day, 1066, in Edward the Confessor's great abbey at Westminster, Duke William of Normandy was crowned King William of England. Over the following years, William succeeded in establishing his authority across the country. In the north, this often involved terrible bloodshed. But by the time of the Norman king's death, 21 years later, in 1087, there could be no doubt that he had changed the English nation forever. Norman uh, conquest turned England into a feudal society, a very different sort of social and political structure from the Scandinavian uh, Anglo-Saxon structure it had before. England had a new system of economic organization, a new system of military organization, a changed system of government. So from an elite point of view, 
uh, England was a changed state. But really, all that changed in the Battle of Hastings was that one group of Scandinavian ganger thugs had been replaced at the top of the English state by another group of Scandinavian ganger thugs. This is a place of pilgrimage. People come from all over the world to stand on this spot. On the 14th of October every year, it's a garland of flowers. Harold had his sympathizers without a doubt. Bad luck, Harold. Better luck next time. <laughs>